Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, Investing 2020s. And we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about a Metis, but we're also going to talk about this, World Series Poker. So I get to Las Vegas next Thursday afternoon, and I am going to just be hanging out on Thursday. So if you happen to be in Vegas next Thursday, let me know, and uh, I'll try to hook up that evening. My plan is to walk over to Paris and get signed up for the flight A of the monster stack on Friday. And that's, I'm going to play that. If I bust on Friday, then I'll come back on Saturday. So I'm, I'll be available Thursday night if you happen to be in Vegas. The plan is to play through at least Monday, and that'll get me very deep into the cash. The final table for the monster stack is on Tuesday. So, you know, I'd love to be there. Who knows? Um, so either Tuesday, I'm making six figures playing poker, or I'm hanging out. So I think Tuesday, June 20th would be a day that I can meet with you as well. Or again, if I'm final tabling, then you can come and be on TV with me. And then on Wednesday, June 21st, I am playing the seniors event, which I took 60th in last year out of 7,200 people. I'm going to try to final table this one. So we'll see how that goes. Now, I have a whole bunch of friends showing up Thursday and Friday, and they're playing in this million maker tournament, millionaire maker tournament. Um, I think I'm unlikely to play in that because I'm pretty certain I'll get to day two on the senior event. If I don't make day three, I might end up playing the millionaire maker on Saturday. So we'll see. Again, Tuesday this week, the 27th, I should be pretty available if you're in Vegas. So the Tuesdays, the first Thursday, next Thursday, and then the two Tuesdays, the 20th and the 27th, I should be pretty available. On Wednesday, the 28th, I play the Pot Limit Omaha High Low, and um, I cashed that event last year as well. Friday night, I'm probably available. And Saturday during the day, I'm probably available, the 30th and the 1st. Now, if I'm net positive, $40,000 or more, I'm actually going to stay past the first. I'm supposed to fly home this night or this evening. If I'm up 40 grand net of all my expenses, uh, buy-ins, hotel, everything, hotel's been going to be pretty cheap, actually. Um, you know, but if I'm up 40 grand, I'll stay. And then I'll play in the mini main event and I'll play in the main event, the one that everybody thinks about. So most folks don't realize there's all these events, but, um, if I'm up 40 grand, then I'll stay an extra week, play the main event for the first time. And I don't even know how long this lasts. I think it lasts two weeks, something like that. But, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. So if you want to come out to Vegas or you happen to be in Vegas, let me know. I know a couple of you will be there. So, um, yeah, try to track me down on the 20th or the 27th, probably, or June 30th. If I'm not final tabling the PL08, I'm just going to be doing Vegas stuff that day. All right, so a menace. Been pretty exciting a uh, couple of days. Go to the five-day chart, pop this out. Just using a little Yahoo Finance because it's easy if it works, right? So go to the five-day. So a heck of a rally, right? Go to the one month. That's pretty good. So this doesn't feel so bad yesterday when you notice that, right? So today... The shorts have had a hard time pushing the stock down. I think that they are just about out of juice. I have asked some people I know what they think is going on, and they all seem to agree with me, is that the bottom right here was probably it for the pullback. It got down to almost what, five and a quarter yesterday. It goes to go back, right? It got down to 522 today as well. It closed at 571 yesterday. But I think it was down at this 522 as well. We'll take a look at this chart. There you go. So let's just make this five days. So yeah, yesterday it got down to 512 and 523. But you can see it just wants to keep going higher. What the shorts did is they bought a whole bunch of puts. And they probably were shorting on margin as well as best they could. But they're going to have big margin calls on Monday. Because borrowing shares to short basically has an interest rate of 100%. So they have to double their money just to be even. And I think what you're going to see with the new short numbers 
uh, in a couple of weeks is that a lot of the shorts have been evaporating. We know that they have already um, started to evaporate. If we go to NASDAQ, you, know, you can put in any symbol you want. They will give you the, how did I lose it? Oh, there we go, that's what I wanted. And they will give you the short interest. So as of 515, and they don't have the new report up, there were 60, six and a half million shares short versus, uh, you know, it peaked out here at about seven and a half million. I actually already thought the new report was out. No, the new report's out tomorrow. So the new report through the end of May, I'm guessing this is going to be a number in the five millions. And here's what I would point out is that the amount of money shorting Ametis last month when the stock was around two was only about 13, 14, 15 million dollars. How do I know that? Well, average share price times share short, pretty easy. So 15 million dollars. And I can tell you that between my investors at Blue Mound and other investors I know in my own money, that the buying pressure exceeded the people who were short selling pressure. What do I mean? Is that the people who were buying are just way fucking richer than the people who were selling. So these guys were able to manipulate the stock price down because nobody was interested in it at the time. I hadn't been pounding the table. I had been getting people in, soaking up some of the float. But until I pounded the table a month ago, uh, the people buying were only buying stock and they were not buying the calls. Why is that important? Well, I started adding call exposure last month because I know how this works. When people want to short something as a group, they will buy puts and they will short on margin to force the price down. They overwhelm it mathematically. Well, this company only has, what, 36 million shares outstanding. And we were pretty much the most active part of the options market other than the shorts. So while those shorts were buying puts, we were the ones selling the puts to them and we were collecting the premium. What happened in May is that the difference between the float and the shares available started to evaporate. It got harder and harder to borrow shares because 45% of the company is owned by institutions and 15-ish percent of the company is owned by the insiders. So that's 60%. So you only had 40% of the stock available to short or about 15 to 20 million shares. Well, I can tell you that I know where a couple million of those shares are. And when we started buying the calls, the market makers have to adjust their book by buying shares or at least creating some sort of a hedge that takes more shares out of the pool of shares that can be loaned to the short sellers. The interest rate for shorting this stock went from whatever it was, 20, 30% to 100% in the last month. And I don't think that the hangers on understood that. What you can see here is that from the end of April, when the stock got down to around two, to in here, a million shares of the short interest were covered. And I will ask you, do you think that that was the people who were in Discord rooms and other trading rooms and on Reddit who read about this idea to short this company? Or do you think those first million covered were the people who actually planted the seed in the first place? So on the Yahoo chat board, there's some guy named Matthew running around saying, this is going to be a pump and dump. Nah, man, you can go zuck yourself. All this is, is that the company got so cheap against what the, just the net asset value, not even the business is worth, that smart investors started buying it. And I can tell that there's still people out there who are like, how high is it going to go, Kirk? How high is it going to go? Look, I'm telling you, the net asset value of this company is about one and a half billion dollars. If this company liquidated today, they could sell everything for two billion or more, and then you subtract out the half billion in debt. This company is worth one and a half billion dollars right now, just based on the physical plants, refineries, land that they own, all the equipment, the pipeline. This company is worth one and a half billion dollars right now. If Chevron wanted to come by and just buy it for parts, and Eric just decided, Eric McAfee just decided he didn't want to play anymore. So it's trading at about 250 million right now. That means that this is a six bagger. This is going to go up 600% probably, in my opinion, in about the next year or so. 
And people aren't going to tie it to the net asset value. They're going to tie it to the business developments, the catalysts that I discussed and we lined up. They just had the natural gas information made clear on the tax credits. The state of California is writing some rules too on the California side. So they're going to be able to drop about $50 million in revenue to the top line in the next couple quarters because they had all that natural gas underground and they announced the other day that they started selling it at the end of May. So not only are they getting paid for the natural gas, then there's going to be tax credits attached too. What you really need to understand about the natural gas side of this business is that the margins are obnoxious. Way higher, way higher than ordinary natural gas. The renewable natural gas is going to trade at a margin of roughly double. And depending on the LCFS credits out of California, maybe triple. Can you imagine having triple the margins of, you know, say what some of the other natural gas companies are getting? It's a lot of money. India, they have the tallow contracts that nobody understands. They're getting more contracts from the government for biofuels. So all these catalysts are lined up. At this point, somebody asked me, what value do I assign to the carbon capture? I'll tell you, right now, I don't assign any value in my free cash flow model for the future to the carbon capture. Why? Because carbon capture is hard and we're not positive that you know it'll actually come off. I mean, it probably will, but what if science comes up and says it's just a bad idea and the government changes the rules in three years because you know sticking carbon in the ground ends up being not good? I don't think any of that's going to happen because there is carbon in the ground and we've been doing it for a long time and nature's been doing it for a long time, but I don't assign any value to the carbon capture right now. And I still come up with, this is roughly a $5 billion company, just as the natural gas digesters get built and as the air biofuel starts coming online. So just based on the gas and the air biofuel, I think this is a $5 billion company. I do. And the tallow and the legacy ethanol. $5 $5 billion company without the carbon capture. With the carbon capture, man, it could be well over $10 billion. And remember, the Inflation Reduction Act, for all the people who say that Biden is causing expensive oil, well, he's not because it's not expensive. The deal that the Biden administration did with Conoco for drilling in Alaska, it's basically going to be the future of our strategic petroleum reserve. And the carbon capture credits, which are largely going to go to the big oil and gas companies. And Ametis just happens to be in there. And there's several other small biofuels companies out there that are going to get those tax credits too. But these guys just happen to be in the best position out of all of them. I'd invest in the other ones if they're in this good a position. They're just not. Opal, you know, gets thrown out there. There's a couple others. California Resources. These guys are starting from a small number. And when you stack up just the contracts that are in place, you can't not get the $5 billion in market cap on just conservative ratios about three years from now. And it could happen faster, it could happen a little slower. But in that window of two to four years, this is a $5 billion company. That's 20-fold from today's price. And if the carbon capture works and the pay rates and everything stay about the same, that's enough to double the value of the company probably. Because the tax credits go through the roof. And I've told you the story about the place that I camp in August most years, up in the uh, White Mountains of New Hampshire. Giant camp. I think it's 235 acres, 250 acres, something like that. It's called Camp Quinbarge. Let's look it up real quick. This place is where I camp. And uh, we rent this out the week after it closes every summer. Pretty neat place. Uh, If you want to hang out in uh, Center Harbor, the week that I'm out there, it'd be the last week of August. Uh, Let me know. I'll meet you in Center Harbor or Moulton Burl or something nearby. This place is huge. I don't know if they actually tell us how many acres it is anywhere. I don't see an about. But you can Google Earth it. It's a pretty big place. And the guy who bought that made all his money in carbon credits in Europe. So the camp was starting to get to the point where it needed work. And I don't know if this guy had spent time there as a kid or how he knew about it. I, I met him a couple of times and we really just talked about business, but he made a lot of money in carbon credits. And the oil and gas industry knows that they can skim that sort of thing. And they got that included in the Inflation Reduction Act. It's not something that the left really wanted, just like the left didn't want to see the Alaska deal. 
the net result is going to be this. Our big oil companies will survive. The government's going to sue them and pull a bunch of that money back out. Chevron, Exxon probably aren't going to do great over time because they're the ones that are going to get sued the most. And they're going to lose. They're going to settle. Accidental should do pretty well because it's a newer company, or at least it was smaller. I mean, it's been around, but they haven't done what Exxon and Chevron have done. So when you take a look at how carbon credits are going to work, all you have to do is say, well, if I can invest in a small company that doesn't, doesn't have legacy problems, it's a small number going to a big number, and I know their margins are going to be double or triple the industry averages, it's, pr- it's pretty much a no-brainer. Do they have to execute? For sure. They have to execute. But they've got six dairy digesters online. They got 25 coming, and it's probably going to get way higher than that because there's hundreds of farms in the Central Valley of California. And they have a pipeline. It's already connected. So what does this look like in the next couple of days? Well, I think that on Monday there's going to be margin calls. and People are going to have to figure out what to do about that. I think you'll get the small guys, right? The guy with the $30,000 account that gets blown up and he's down to zero. I think there's going to be a lot of that. A lot of those shares will get unborrowed. That'll create a short squeeze. And I think there's a possibility this stock is around 20 by the next earnings report in August. Now, am I sure that's going to happen? No. Maybe somebody with a lot of money comes in here and just starts soaking up the short position. Could happen. I don't know why they would, given the catalysts that are stacked up, the fact that revenue's coming in, and all the financial problems that people imagined are going to be gone. I really think that this stock sets new all-time highs next year and is well into the 30s, maybe into the 40s. That's what I think. And I think it's an over $100 stock two to four years from now. So take that for what it's worth. But I told you on the absolute lowest day to buy this. So anybody who had been underwater a little bit, because right, we first were buying it in here, bought a little up here. You got a little bit clobbered. Oh, that's the short-term chart, right? You got a little bit clobbered in here. Most people have told me that their average cost basis is between 5 and $8 a share. And that was before I told everybody to load up right here. Right? Three, four days in a row, I told you to buy. Doesn't mean it can't pull back into the fours. If it does, I'm buying more calls. But I have an outstanding order for just 1,100 January calls right now. And they haven't been able to break through that. Not even close. They haven't got within a quarter of my price. So there is very little firepower left to short this right now. The next move up will be pretty much the end of the short squeeze the last couple of days. I mean, you could see this stock go up five bucks in a day. How can I say that? Well, because it's happened before. Right? It's happened twice before. Straight up, straight up. How does that happen? It's just the longs and the shorts fighting it out. Now, if this does spike up here, you know, if it does spike up, then we have to decide do we take profits on our calls? You know, we're just going to have to play it in real time. Um, I don't intend to take any profits on my calls until the stock price is around 20. That 17 to 22 range is where I think it's headed. I don't know if it bumps here or if it bumps right in here. This area here, right there, a little janky to me. So we'll see. Uh, I have a sell order on my January $7.50 covered calls that is very high. It's in the middle to upper teens. And, uh, you know, I'll adjust it in real time at some point. But I take a look at this, and this is one of the best setups I've seen in 25 years for not only a short rally, a short covering rally, but we're going to get several catalysts by year end. The next one is California. Keep watching the LCFS price. I can show you that. Right. The average price is about 83 as of last week. Uh, let's see, there's one that has the, there you go, that one. Right. So you can go through the average weekly prices. You can see what it's been going back a long time. So all the way back, right? You see the prices, 192. And then it collapsed and all the way down to right the 60s, just a few weeks back, you know, back in February and March. And now it's been steadily rising. So we'll see what it is next week. CARB, California, whatever that stands for. So they want this to be between 200 and 250. And they're going to tweak the rules to make that happen. That's all extra money for a Metis because their tax credits are rated so high that they're getting like full freight. So when this number is 200-ish, think about how much money they're earning. Read up what this is so you understand it. So 
The amount of money that's going to be dropping to the bottom line is just immense. Um, the margins are really high and they're likely to go higher in the next year or so before plateauing. Even if a Republican wins in 2024, it's not going to matter. Just like I told you when President Trump was president, he didn't slow any of this down either. And in fact, let's talk about the oil market again. What are we really starting to see that I thought was going to happen in about 2026? We are already seeing that we are at peak oil demand. I've been saying that. I mean, I've said it a hundred times at least. The peak oil demand, the peak oil plateau, which is what I've called it, is about to happen. Where oil demand will be flat for the next few years, right? Maybe it goes up next year, but then it's flat. Because the number of EVs and the shift to working more at home is just killing demand growth. There's no demand growth. We saw the first instance of panic pumping, right? When the OPEC countries wouldn't agree to cuts this weekend. So this transition to cleaner fuels and EVs and solar and everything else, the numbers that start to hit the books next year are going to blow people's minds. How is this happening so fast? But climate change isn't real, I heard. But Fox News said. But Breitbart. But Newsmax. All the people that read that stupid shit are going to get crushed on their investments. Thing is, most of them don't have any money in the first place. I wrote an article that I've not released. Maybe I will. It's kind of a mean article, but it's titled How I'm Going to Take Climate Change Deniers Money. And you still have 30, 40% of the population that thinks that these things aren't going to take hold. They think we're not going to shift the EVs. They think we're not going to kill coal all the way. You know, so we'll see. But this decarbonization theme that we have is huge, huge. All right. Let's talk about the market a minute. We're just going to make this a quick call today. If a Metis, by the way, falls under, I'd say, 550 and makes a run at five again, uh, that might be your last chance. I just don't see the shorts winning here. I think they're almost dead. And I think they'll be mostly dead next week. I just don't know where they get the firepower to overpower this anymore. This breakout could be imminent to the 20s or 20-ish. We'll see. If I can buy more January 750 calls uh, for a buck, that's what my order's in at, I will. And I might even take them in a buck and a quarter. We'll see. I think they're at 135 at the open and they've gone up. So we'll see. As far as the broader market goes, you saw a number today and everything's being, everything's being overshadowed by the fact that now Canada's on fire. See, now it's not just people in the desert that are on fire. It's freaking Canada. You're going to see the move towards decarbonization accelerate yet again. And we have uh, El Nino this year, which apparently is ruining the weather patterns. So NASDAQ is still up a bit. S&P is still up. Crude oil down. This is what I wonder about. Is the Fed going to pause or skip next week? Because the unemployment claims rose. And everybody in the press says unexpectedly, but I don't know what was unexpected about it. We've been looking at the lists of all the people getting laid off in tech for a few months now. People are like, well, they're just going to go back to work. No, they're not. They're going to take the summer off. Think about it like a human. If you're a tech person who's been making six years and you just got laid off, unless you're pressed on your bills, you're taking the summer off. You're evaluating your options. You're having a good time. You're maybe working on the side, but you're going to collect that check. And then, you know, in a few months, you're going to say, well, let's start throwing the resumes out. If the Fed is smart, they raise a quarter point next week and just put an exclamation point on it. And let everything go to where it belongs. Either way, and I just can't see the stock market breaking out in the short term, but I sure see it breaking out later on. The risk is that it breaks out now. So I think you should be aggressively selling puts on all the companies that you like, right? Instead of using limit orders, sell a put, collect the premium, and essentially have a one or two month limit price based on your put. And if it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, you collect a premium. That's better than just having a good till cancel order never hit. Sell the puts. If you're not a put seller tonight, go online and learn how to do it. That is my most important message for people who take the approach that I do which is I like to hold cash in my account for op- for optionality, right? The ability to strike when the iron is hot, like here with the Metis. I have accounts that are 25% of Metis right now. They won't stay that way, but this is a rare opportunity to make a lot of money. That's why I call one of my services rare investing. So 
So we'll see if the liquidity suck coming from treasuries, coming from the summer slowdown, now a whole bunch of 401k rollovers and something will get pilfered, and the stressed out banks. I forget which big financial guy said that we're at the front end of a credit crisis, but I did see somebody discuss, oh, it was, it was Bill Ackman who was talking about you know, he owns a third of uh, Howard Hughes. They make the master plan communities. Not dissimilar to what I'm talking about with the private real estate investments, which I'll have an announcement about at the end here. But they couldn't get a project finance that's half done. They talked to 48 banks and they're like, we just, we just don't have the liquidity to do it right now. So he had to go out and raise the money from private investors who largely are sitting on cash, right? All you folks who are sitting on cash, these next several quarters, and I think really through this winter for sure, but it might be for a year and a half, two years, we've talked about this, your ability to invest in private real estate deals because the banks are hamstrung, this might be the best opportunity for a very long time, right? There's always another one, but I think for a very long time. Interest rates are a little bit high. The banks are tight. We're short on housing still. This is a neat opportunity. So we'll see how much volatility we get in the next couple of months. If I had to guess, I would say that if we have a recession, it is still short and shallow, a couple quarters, maybe maybe three quarters, but it's not going to be like negative 4% GDP. It's going to be like fractionally below zero. Employment is still strong. Demand is still strong. As long as housing gets built, I think we avoid stagflation. But if the housing market dries up, especially the new constructions, that worries me. I don't think it's going to happen because we're not finding any shortage of liquidity out there. It's just in a different place. Liquidity used to be at the banks, not at the banks right now. It's all it's private investors who sat on cash because they got spooked after COVID, after the big rally. And it's not that they always know what they're doing, right? It's not that investors always know. Sometimes we just get emotional at the right time. So people who sold at the end of 2021, whether they were listening to me or they just had a feeling, it worked out. So now I would push you to think next level think, what am I going to do next? And what's next is small caps and emerging markets because interest rates are going to start coming down next year or sooner. And that's good for real estate too. So if we're in a tight real estate financing moment and the interest rates are a little higher, the only thing that can happen down the road is interest rates go a little lower. Again, unless we get stagflation, but I don't think that's going to happen because I don't see any shortage of private investor money. So let me talk about the one opportunity that I have coming up and let you know that next Wednesday, I've arranged a Zoom call for the people who are interested in seeing what this firm I work with does. They've got three different things that they're working on right now, and I'm sure there'll be a fourth and a fifth later this year or next year. The specific property they're going to raise money for in August. So really, they just want to kind of show you and see who's interested in talking more on Wednesday is 41 luxury units, about a mile and a half from the Milwaukee uh, uh, the, the Medical College of Wisconsin, which is in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, actually, a suburb. I think they'll fill quickly because they're not out of line. And the project is on Blue Mound Road. You'll know that name from my firm. And the internal rate of return is 14 to 15%. They're modeling it out at 14.7 or something. You can listen to them on it. And they'll have an exit plan for about five years out. And they think they'll roughly double their money. I don't know if they quite get there, if they're a little short, a little more, but that's been the rate of increase in the Milwaukee area lately. And these guys are very conservative about how they structure deals because it's a lot of their own money. These are not private equity guys who are making money as private equity guys. This is them taking their family office money and putting it into private realty deals. I approached them last year to learn and potentially raise money for them. Because I think that these new structures, they're basically dropping in new buildings into neighborhoods that need to be redeveloped. And it's just been an amazingly profitable thing for them. And I wanted to take part. So I'm going to start investing with them. Uh, anything that I raise, uh, my uh, placement fee uh, goes directly into equity in the deal. I'm not taking any cash, zero. It's all going into deal equity. That's how much I believe in it. I'm not taking direct compensation. So next Wednesday, there'll be a Zoom at 3 p.m. Central, and you can meet these guys. You can hear what they have to say, how they operate, and then decide if you want to talk to them more about projects. And you can talk to me more about it off the record or on the record. What else? 
yeah, that's about it. If you want to get the link, just direct message me or email me letters at crooksfunnel.com. Just tell me why you're an accredited investor. Say my income's high enough or I have over a million bucks invested, right? That, that's the criteria. You got to have an income of it's either two or 300,000 a year and a million bucks invested. So if you got a million bucks invested and you, or you make two or 300,000, you're allowed to do this. It's only for accredited investors. I did get the minimum from $300,000 down to 100,000 just so you can give them a taste. If you just want to try them on for size, you can try them on for size. Uh, you don't have to make the full $300,000 commitment, which is typical. Um, they'll take 100,000 from folks that know me. So I'll let that be. Let's um, get back together on Monday and go through even more stocks. I hope you took a look at the stocks of the week's articles this week. I did two, one on dividend stocks, one on growth stocks. I gave pretty explicit directions on how I'm thinking about what I'm going to buy, what I'm not going to buy, what I'm going to trim, what I'm looking for. So a lot of actionable plans on what, 40 some odd stocks. And uh, I'm going to add two stocks to the plug and play next week. Each article, you can figure out who it is because one of them is already listed and I talked about the other one on air. Uh, so it's actually EPR and Teladoc. Those are both getting added. And I think that we have the ability to buy them imminently sometime this summer. All right, have a great day. And if you don't have your full asset allocation in a meta somehow, I think you need to start scaling in because I don't know that this is going to come back much. I mean, you might have a couple days where it might come back, but I think this is it. I think it's ignited. All right. Take care.